Okay, I'm going to start off with a video that uh, the first one that goes over a um, simple explanation that I wanted to give you in class, but I didn't have time. Um, we've been working on differential equations that are in general going to look like so. Newton's law of motion is going to guarantee we get a uh, x double dot at n times acceleration. And this general system is, is called a mass spring damper system. It turns out that a lot of our derivations with the different complex geometries of the vehicles will be able to be put into this form and we'll be able to get common solutions from them. So I claimed in class that the solution to this differential equation is in general going to look like some arbitrary constant x times e to the st. So if we di differentiate this multiple times, we can make this equation hold. Um, equation one and this is the general solution if we substitute that in we can find the results this s value if we figure out what it is it's going to tell us exactly how this system behaves as a function of time and s is called the eigenvalue of the system and in general it is complex valued And this complex number um, arises because we find the characteristic equation of an equation of motion, um, solve for the roots of that polynomial, it's a general polynomial, and we're going to find these eigenvalues, and in general they're going to be complex values. Sometimes they're real, but many times they're complex. So what that means is, is that x of t then looks like e to the a plus or minus b i t where i is the square root of negative one this imaginary value and having this imaginary value in the solution is isn't always that useful and easy to think about um, but it turns out that any exponential to an imaginary value can be written in terms of sines and cosines. And that's very nice that we can do that because then we can think about this thing um, more realistically. Um, and how do we do that? Well, Euler came up with a lot of formulas. And he, um, and one of them, Euler's formula or Euler's identity can be written like so e to the i theta, where i is this imaginary value, theta is any arbitrary real value there, equals cosine theta plus i sine theta. This relates an exponential to sines and cosines. If you recall, the solutions to the spring mass damper system often have oscillations and it has decay or growth. So these e's and the cosines and the sines allude to the kind of solutions that we're going to see. So we can rewrite equation two as two new equations. Um, we'll do three x of t equals x1 big X1, e to the a plus b i t, and then um, x2 will have a different coefficient, a plus, sorry, minus b i. So these are the two independent solutions there for the two eigenvalues. And they can be rewritten using Euler's formula. It's going to give us x1 times 
times e to the at all times cosine pt plus i sine pt. And then equation 4 there will look like e to the at cosine negative bt plus i sine negative bt. Equation 4 can be uh, reduced a bit using some simple trig identities to bring these negatives outside of the cosines and sines. So we can rewrite that as e to the at um, cosine of bt minus i sine bt. All right. Now we're working with linear ordinary differential equations. And one of the properties of those um, is that if you have two solutions to this equation, the sum of those solutions is also a solution. So in our case, if x1 of t and x2 of t are solutions, then x1 of t plus x2 of t is also a solution. So that's useful. Now we can add these together. So we can say that a solution for these two eigenvalues equals x1. Let me rewrite this. I'm going to pull the e to the at out of both of them. And then just write all this, expand these things out. x1 cosine bt plus x1 I sine bt and then uh, plus x2 cosine bt minus x2 i sine bt and then combine terms e to the at x1 plus x2 cosine bt plus x1 minus x2 i sine bt. So this is looking nice. We've got an e to the at sine and cosine, we still have an imaginary number in here. Well, in general, um, or not in general, but um, x1, it's important to note that x1 and x2 um, will be also be complex conjugate pairs. we solve for those and they depend on the initial conditions of this uh, system but they are going to be complex conjugate pairs so if x1 is uh, C if x1 comma x2 write that if x1 uh, comma x2 equals c plus or minus di, then x1 plus x2 equals c, 2c, and x1 minus x2 equals 2di. But if we look at this whole thing here, we have 2di squared. And i squared 
equals negative 1. So what this allows us to do is that for each of these coefficients, we can rewrite those as a real valued number. And I'm going to pick um, a1 to be x1 minus x2 times i, and a2 to be x1 plus x2. They're real valued. So x of t then becomes e to the a t a1 times sine b t plus a2 cosine b t. Looking pretty good there. Um, now we have this solution that's in terms of all real values. Sine, cosines, the two a's, and the et. Um, and we can see that we're going to get some oscillatory function, the sine plus cosine, multiplied by e to the at, which if a is positive or negative, we will see divergence or convergence of that. So this, in general, corresponds to some kind of functions that either decay and oscillate or grow and oscillate, if we look at the function of time. What we, what we would expect. It's also useful to note that you can rewrite this equation x of t as big A e to the a t times sine b t plus phi. And then a equals a1 squared plus a2 squared square root of that and phi equals the arctan of a2 over a1. So some trig identities can be used to convert to that. Then phi becomes the phase angle and A is this um, initial amplitude. And both of those are determined by the initial conditions. But this solution here um, is very useful. We want to recall then that the eigenvalue was a plus or minus b i. And we can see now that a, the real part, governs decay or growth over time and then b which is the imaginary part governs the frequency of oscillation if we then think about the real and imaginary plane And we put this complex conjugate pair of eigenvalues. So this is a plus b minus b. And a can be positive or negative. I'm drawing it where a is a, will be a negative value. Then the location of these 
so-called eigenvalues in the real imaginary plane tell us um, whether the system's stable or unstable. So if they're to the left of the imaginary axis, they're stable. If they happen to be the right, they're unstable. Okay. And then this B value, how far away, if they're further away from the real axis, they're going to have higher frequency. Right. So as these are moved away from the axis, you get higher frequency, or, and then and the closer they are to the real axis, you get lower frequency. So you can write it like this, I guess. Higher frequency, lower frequency. Okay, that ends the first video. It gives you an idea of why, what these eigenvalues mean. Why can I get a complex eigenvalue and find this characteristic equation, get these eigenvalues from it, the complex value, and then what the real and the imaginary parts mean for us.